Welcome to the live launch of the Gender and Development Journal Reimagining Development Issue live launch. And I'm here with some of the authors and with Caroline Sweeten, who co edited the journal with me. And I'm going to introduce, first of all, Caroline, just to give an introduction to the journal. Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I'm Caroline Sweetman and I edit Gender and Development Journal as its permanent editor and I have the pleasure of working with some amazing guest editors. Marianne was my guest editor for this issue. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's catalyzed by the publication of the issue. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the context of the issue, which is very consciously an active activist project. Um, so Oxfam started the journal um, in the lead up to the Beijing conference, uh, which we're commemorating this year. Um, obviously, with COVID-19, um, we're going to be finding that a challenge, um, but uh, that is the general aim. Um, at, this, at that time, global feminisms were already very, very stridently and strongly challenging development to change. Gender, race and class underpinned the image of feminists 25 years ago who got together that year to demand a radically different model of development, one which recognised the contribution of women living in poverty in a global system that was basically um, capitalising on the exploitation of those women, uh, creating inequalities and using up the finite, finite resources of the planet. Um, this journal, um, from that day to this, has been based um, on a belief in the importance of knowledge and analysis from women and the critical importance of recording what feminists call herstory. So the journal, in all of the issues, and especially in this one, we aim to provide a space for dialogue between feminist activists in development policy practice and research and outside in the wider women's rights movements. Um, they can use that space, we hope, to debate, share good ideas, critique bad practice, challenge interna international development for its shortcomings and for its failure so far to realize that Beijing vision of radical change. Um, we particularly invite contributions from voices who maybe wouldn't even consider this sort of publishing. Perhaps they consider it irrelevant, elitist, or close to them. Often, um, in fact, the experience of actually creating content and uh, producing a journal article actually does offer, offer um, opportunities for them to have conversations and influence power holders, however, uh, holding a journal issue in their hands. Um, we deliberately adopt a non-academic style to widen access so we can share across the boundaries of research and activism, policy and practice. Okay, so today our reimagining development issue goes live on our website. If you Google us, um, Google gender and development and the journal will pop up quite quickly in that uh, list. And you can see how to get access to all the articles if you go to our website. You can also read the blog Marianne and I uh, wrote together. All our content's available as a conventional journal, but crucially, it is available via our website, free access, in line with our commitment in Oxfam to the journal as a development initiative. So please get involved, read the issue, but please think about getting involved as a writer as well, um, and spread the word if you like what you see. Um, so welcome, I'm going to hand back to Marianne now to take us through the amazing um, speakers we've got lined up for you um, as they speak about their articles. Um, and here's to a great dialogue. Thanks. All right, so, um, so I'm Marianne Clements, as many of you will know, and as Caroline said, this particular edition of the Gender and Development Journal was sort of inspired by the first Healing Solidarity Conference, which I initiated in 2018. And so when the call went out for people for this journal, we were looking for people who were interested in the idea of conceptualizing development as solidarity, or uh, who were interested in thinking about a context in which equity um, is a central value and concern and how we do the work of what we've been calling international development people who are interested in exploring racism as it continues to show up in development work and how we might address it. And articles that we're interested in changing how we think about our work, how we see ourselves, 
and ensuring that our political analysis is central to how we do the work that we do. We're also interested in articles that we're thinking about recognising the toll that activism can take on us because that's another central theme in healing solidarity um, and the impact of such an inexorable system as many of the authors um, point out and as, as many 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 authors have pointed out before this journal obviously but the impact of that inexorable system on how we work and the ways in which some of our working practices seem to continue to exploit and exhaust many people involved in and around the sector so this issue of the Gender and Development Journal includes a range of different articles coming from really different places, exploring the ways in which we might do things differently. And as you'll hear from the four um, authors who are here with us today, they really do do that in very different ways. So I'm excited about hearing from each of them and then having a discussion together. So I just want to run through a few of the other things that are in the journal just to give you an idea and pique your interest and then we'll share with you how you access the journal. Um, uh, um, a bit later on. So all the articles explore different facets of what a solidarity that heals injustice might look like. And um, there's a piece from Neha Cargo and Leah Latchford who explore in six sectional perspectives on development and ask um, really pertinent questions about who's being developed and by whom with an intersectional analysis and you'll be able to find that in the journal. There's one from Emily Reagan Wills and Diane El Rishani and Nadia Abu Zahar, I hope I said that right, um, who discuss an initiative run by the Canadian institution where they work that explores how being rooted in Indigenous principles could strengthen solidarity. There's a piece from Tina Wallace that reflects on many decades of work on gender equality and women's rights and the changing trends as INGOs seem to become ever more professionalised and bureaucratic seemingly making them less able to generate useful models of solidarity. Um, there's an article about the work of Roots Lab, a feminist programme piloted by a group of partners, including Frida Oxfam, the Global Fund for Women in Lebanon, and it's, Lebanon, sorry, and exploring how difficult it can be to do things differently within the existing structures of international development. Um, um, Brianna, Brianna Strom explores using feminist practice de to decolonize our own approaches through critical reflection on how and what we do. And there's a great piece from Shauna Wakefield and Kirsten Zimmerman that highlights the ways in which our working practices seem to create conditions in which staff often feel burnout, burnt out and ineffective. And it explores some of the ways in which activists in and actually very much beyond the sector also are exploring therapeutic and spiritual practices to build resilience and change the way they work. It's a really rich collection of articles that I'm really proud to have co-edited with Caroline and they build on many of the ideas that many of you will have heard shared in the Healing Solidarity online conferences, collective and events. And they really delve into the deeper questions of how we might practice reimagining this work. I think what I really wanted to say is that obviously aren't simple answers to all of this, but I'm really committed, committed to the idea that the how we do what we do matters as much as the what sometimes um, we've, I think, been guilty of neglecting that, that thought about what, how is our own practice potentially contributing to, to issues as well as um, how, do we, how do we generate practice that really, that really serves our, our values and builds solidarity. And so how we show up for and practice our own work is something that I hope this journal will inspire us all to consider. So um, yeah, today it's a really great pleasure to introduce you to four authors from the journal, each of whom is going to share with us something about their article and the main points it raises in relation to the question of how should, should we and could we reimagine the idea of international development. Um, each comes from a really different perspective and I hope you're going to really enjoy hearing more about them. I'm going to introduce them as we go and we're going to start with Jessica. I'm just going to check Jessica's there. There you are. Hi. Uh, um, hi. Let's make sure we can... Yeah, no, I'm here. Yeah. Hi, welcome. <laughs> Great to see you. I'm yeah. say, can I say something about you? Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Okay. So first of all, we've got Jessica Horn. So um, for those who don't know Jessica, she's a women's rights and gender equality expert, currently director of programmes at African Women's Development Fund. 
She's worked for two decades supporting activist organisations, donors and the UN to deepen analysis, shape policy and funding and refine interventions to defend women's rights to health, bodily autonomy and freedom from violence, to build activist leadership, strengthen social movements and develop strategies for building feminist futures. And she's an all round awesome human being. And her article in this journal is called Decolonizing Emotional Wellbeing and Mental Health and Development, African Feminist Innovations. Welcome, Jessica. <laughs> oh, I don't hear you now. Who are you? Do others hear Jessica? I can't hear you. What happened? <laughs> can't hear you ah oh. is it me there, yeah. you Sorry. there we go yeah no i think as a host no that's fine <laughs> so my child has decided that this is the moment to cry oh that's wonderful <laughs> and so we're going to talk about pain in the context of somebody's pain very like yeah. for real um so apologies for that um and i hope that you can hear about yeah. The cry. yeah yeah it's, <laughs> all right it's fine. Go ahead. okay good so um this piece was really trying to look at the ways that um, African feminists are working in, in practical, in a practical sense, political, but in practice, um, to really uh, find ways to deal with the whole question of thinking about emotional well-being and mental health in this transformative, radical African feminist, and of course, implicitly decolonial way. Um, and so, and in particular, to look at the question of the emotional well-being and mental health of practitioners. Um, as Marianne mentioned, that's a big area um, that's only now um, getting a level of discussion, but I think not a broad appreciation of how critical it is um, in the broader sector and certainly around, amongst some of the more kind of conventional um, large donors um, and governmental donors in particular, who are the main resources of the development sector, I think have still yet to embrace this idea. So it looked in particular at a case study of AIR, which was an initiative that I helped to create, um, which was a, a network of African practitioners who were working very hands-on around questions of emotional well-being and mental health in context of armed conflict, in context of dealing with violence against women and the sort of devastation um, of HIV AIDS, but also asking the questions of what methodologies we use and whether those methodologies are contributing to addressing the root causes of distress but also um, in ways that actually do heal and help to build resilience. So it looks, uh, as I said, an, a, a particular case study of AIR. Um, and um, so the AIR was created um, in the mid 2000s in response to a request from Pansy Hospital, which many of you know, um, as a, a, a hospital in the Eastern Republic, Democratic Republic of Congo, that was dealing with the question of violence against women um, in the context of war. Um, and um, so Pansy, sorry, this is quite distracting. <laughs> Pick her up. Pick her up. Yeah, it won't work. She's like, my mom is on a call about me. What kind of device is this without a child? <laughs> um, but the truth is, again, as everybody was concerned about them and their amazing work dealing with the women, they had had a crisis on their hands in terms of their own staff. And the fact that their own staff, of course, came from the context that they were working in, had borne witness to many of the crimes of the, you know, that they were then helping to kind of heal, um, you know, on the operating tables, et cetera. And they had their own crisis um, when it came to the emotional well-being and mental health of staff. So we began there with a solidarity intervention with other African practitioners. But as we did it, we realized that there really was a need to think about and interrogate um, the methods that we were using, some of the assumptions and frameworks we were using um, that came out of a very behavioralist, sort of results-driven post-traumatic stress disorder frame, which is very common in Western psychology. And I should say that I understand that Western psychology is a very, very broad church, and actually there are radical traditions within Western psychology. But um, most of the traditions that are drawn on to do work in development come from a relatively... Um, depoliticized sort of rapid entry um you know three months in get some results you know tick off a box type of approach which is how development works <laughs> for the most part and so and so we realized that was problematic so we wanted to delve deeper and to document some of the tremendous methodologies that African practitioners were putting into practice, but also ask questions about what communities do to respond. Because we also acknowledge the fact that actually in most of these communities there are no um 
uh, know people trained in the Western tradition of psychology or psychiatry, and yet people are finding ways to actually deal with this tremendous burden of recovering from, you know, the realities of conflict, um, of mass displacement, um, you know, of violence, um, and finding ways to do that. So the question was how. So just in broad view, these are some of the kind of main points in that article. So the first is that really we agreed and articulated a way of engaging the idea that the stress is structural, the stress is political, that the root cause of the stress is political, it has structural orig origins. And it's not just interpersonal, it's not just the result of bad behavior on somebody, you know, or a bad decision, or even that's, you know, that somebody was in the wrong place at the wrong time or had a bad family or whatever it is that sometimes Western psychology can analyze. That actually the, the roots of all of that distress is structural. And so if that's the case, then actually the ways that we approach dealing with the distress also have to be addressing some of those structural questions and acknowledging that there's a politics to what we're doing and to making sure that our interventions are also done in a way that addresses, again, some of, some of those um, of those concerns. And it, this is, it appears uncontroversial, but actually the clinicians in the group, you know, explain that actually it is very controversial because, for example, the idea is that as a counselor, you're there really to provide in the moment of the counseling experience. And if a client comes to you with questions that are about other things in their lives, that it's not really your domain to intervene. And some of the clinicians were saying that actually we feel that it is, that we have to stand in solidarity. If we're dealing with clients who are facing a wave of xenophobic attacks, we need to stand up and say something about that. Or facing crises around housing or food, we can't actually just say, okay, but we're just here to address the emotional dimension um, of your distress and the structural issues we can you know, give to somebody else. Um, so again, acknowledging that distress is structural. That secondly, to acknowledge that distress is not, not individual, that actually all of us live in some way collectively, um, whether that's with family or chosen family um, and in community in some way. And so to also understand that the impact of distress on one person extends to more people. And so when we're looking then at, at techniques for addressing distress, we also have to think about that collective self and the reality of that collective self. And again, we're doing this as feminists, so we're not assuming um, that always every woman has a child or a husband or whatever, right? People live in all sorts of different permutations of, of family and collectivity. We also acknowledge that actually in a lot of the communities that we were engaging, people have been displaced, some stigmatized because of what they've been through um, um, as a result of HIV status or war or conflict, and that they found new collectivities that they are looking to belong to. Um, so in a feminist way to understand that that collectivity is quite varied, but still that that collective is still impacted by individual distress. And so we need to think about a slightly less individualized way of understanding both the, the impact of, but then also potentially the healing approaches, right, when we're thinking about, and that's why collective care is actually quite a real thing. Um, and to also look at therapeutic approaches. So again, part of what's happened with the expansion of the domain of Western psychology into development practice is the idea that talk therapies and, and you know, sort of CBT, for example, are a, are a gold standard or sort of the ideal approach. And we thought, well, but what happens in communities? So as mentioned, there are lots of communities that deal with the reality where there is no Western trained psychologists or psychiatrists, but, but they are um, managing to find ways to reconstruct self. How do they do it? Um, and so we acknowledge that in a lot of communities, there is a, a very uh, intentional use of music, of dance, of different kinds of collective practices. Um, what we realized in a way was that, and again, it's not to frame Africans as being musical or whatever, which can be done. It's more that are, these are methodologies that people use because they're tapping into understandings of the self, of energy, of how to shift up, how people feel. Um, and they're doing them in ways that make sense in the cultural context that they're operating in. And that also they do them with intent. So it's not just that people come and decide to dance, it's that they actually say, we're going to help heal each other in this moment. And then they put that intention into it. And so what we realized is that actually what matters is methodologies that are done with therapeutic intent. 
And then you can think, that means you can think quite broadly about the kinds of therapies that you could use if they're done with therapeutic intent. It kind of opens up a whole range of methodologies. The other piece is what we call livelihoods therapy. That to realize that for a lot of people, one of the devastating impacts um, of violation um, is actually this reduction in economic agency. And, um, and that if we looked at what would happen if we looked at livelihoods work, not in this kind of relatively anemic form of economic empowerment and what have you, but as a form of therapy and approached it in a therapeutic way, um, as a way to see people being able to increase economic agency, that they can regain dignity in a sense that they can manage their lives and do things for their families and for themselves in an autonomous way. That can actually bring a great amount of dignity and also help people to recover from what they feel is the lack of agency experienced in the context of a violation or in moments of systematic distress and displacement. I'll end soon, <laughs> the wiggly child. Um, another piece is just that when we were looking at the question of practitioners, we very often think about this idea of vicarious trauma and the idea that, um, that in some respects, doing the work creates, creates trauma for practitioners and that by being exposed to people um, who are experiencing distress, we then as practitioners experience trauma. And in a way, politically, I mean, it's true, it can be true, but that politically, it's important to also rethink that idea, partly because it, maybe not intentionally, but it can also stigmatize and say that, okay, so that means that people with distress are sort of inevitably going to come here to just distress us all, right, as practitioners. And that actually, in many cases, um, practitioners find that there's a tremendous amount that they learn from the constituencies that they're dealing with in the healing moment, um, that you're learning by seeing other people's um, ability to survive or to surmount odds or to, you know, find different ways of understanding themselves. And so, um, you know, introducing this concept that was developed um, by researchers who were, who were studying um, Colombian practitioners of vicarious resilience and the idea that we don't necessarily only just absorb trauma from people that we are in solidarity with on emotional well-being and mental health questions, we could also absorb their resilience. Um, which I think is a very beautiful way of capturing both the truth of it, but also rethinking, like I said, that power dynamic around the idea that constituencies of relatively marginalized people are somehow inherently bringing this distress, you know, upon everybody else by sharing and, and searching for healing, which I think is, is problematic. So to think about the fact that there is also a different relationship there, um, which, is, which is also teaching us something about resilience. Um, um, and so um, that sort of is in some, some of the ideas that are captured and explored. Um, and really um, part of the way that I did it was really in a citational practice for me was very important um, to also really try to ensure that the citation was also citing African feminist knowledge production in this area. It is an area where there is um, a lot more practice than there is written. Um, and one of the one of the things that Air was concerned about was to create documentation that could be citable, so that we could contribute to expanding this canon of thinking. And I think that that's also one critical area when it comes to decolonizing development. Because my opening contention is that to decolonize uh, development, you actually have to decolonize knowledge and the idea about who knows and who knows best when it comes to what needs to happen in people's lives. Um, and so. Um, this offering was partly a way of showing what practitioners are doing and have done um, and the kinds of questions that are being raised, um, including questions that practitioners themselves don't know and are looking to broader communities to understand, um, you know, what knowledge is and what techniques and approaches are there in community that also help us better understand what to do, because that's another power knowledge dynamic where which development is set up of the idea of the expert. Um, and that carries on into our own work as well. Um, even if we are of the community, we're still positioned as experts within the community and this idea that somehow we still know better. Um, and so to really upset that and ask questions back in terms of who knows really and who knows best, which is a key part of decolonizing um, the development sector and development thinking and power dynamics. So I'll end there and thank you for bearing with me on the childcare issues.
Thanks, Jessica. It's absolutely fine. Um, it was nice to hear her. <laughs> There's a couple of questions, but what I think we'll do is we'll hold them until all the presenters have spoken and then we're going to come, come back to a question. So just, it's fine to keep putting your questions in the chat. I'm keeping a, a hold of all of those and we'll come back to them. Um, so uh, we, I'm going to now welcome Ella. Ella, are you there? Let's see if I can make sure I um, mute, unmute you. <laughs> Where are you? Oh, Ella. Can you hear me, Ella? You there? Yes, I'm here. Hello, hello. Hi. So everyone, this is Ella. She says she's a facilitator, collaborator, and activist in the fields of human rights and social innovation in Southern Africa with a background ranging from human rights law to business, from academia to the arts and her varied experience of, and interests have allowed her to play with new ways to connect seemingly disparate worlds using social justice and feminist activism as a linchpin. And in the, her article in the journal, it's co-authored with Ishtar Lahani and it's called Caution, Feminists at Work, Building Organizations from the Inside Out. So, hi Ella, welcome. Hello, hello. Thanks so much for being with us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I feel like we've been having this conversation for a while now in Healing Solidarity and it's so lovely to be able to open up the conversation and get some perspectives Absolutely. from some other people. <laughs> so thanks. Absolutely. Uh, so just in terms of an intro to the article, Ishtar and I um, working as feminist activists in the human rights space in South Africa and across Southern Africa have been thinking about writing this for, well, been thinking about this work, but thinking about the article for quite a long time, wanting to start articulating um, how the two of us in our work, but also in our organizational communities are grappling with this question of, and this experience of the disconnect between the purpose that our organizations have in the world, whether it's the right to health or access to justice and the disconnect between that purpose and how that purpose is experienced internally inside the organization by employees, by volunteers, by those who are directly doing the work in the world. And this was reflected um, in the broader world with hashtag me too and lots of manifestations and human rights organizations were being uh, outed and there were women coming forward saying there are deep contradictions um, between the work that we're doing in the world and how we're experiencing it with experiences of sexual harassment abuses of power uh, and social justice organizations were having to ask themselves really difficult questions the people inside them leadership as well as members really difficult questions around how do we connect how do we reconnect with this purpose when we're directly seeing the impact of where that disconnect is taking place so then we were asking ourselves, fine then, what does equality feel like every day? What does justice feel like in an organizational practice? Um, and, and how do we engage with that? And this is in a broader context, which I think people have been talking a lot, a long time around NGOization of resistance and how in international development and local development, the NGOization of resistance and politics and, and organizing has led to this kind of characteristic of being very hierarchical and bureaucratic and patriarchal in its ways of working. And what does that mean? Um, if development with a capital D is those things, then what does development of our relationships, so development of the small d, in terms of how we are with each other and how we are in our organizational practices on an everyday, and so we wanted to write this article to explore how we've experienced some of those things in our organizing practices in South Africa and how that might offer some ideas for other organizations who have been thinking similarly and are faced with similar challenges. And those questions were around how internally do we ask ourselves these questions? Um, who do we listen to? How do we engage with those power dynamics that are at play, whether it's external with donors and funders, um, or whether it's internal with regards to identity politics and the powers that are at play between all of us. Um, and that might cause silencing, that might cause um, other kinds of injustices. So when we're fighting for justice in the world, how are we fighting for justice for each other? 
um, on an everyday basis. So using a feminist lens around the personal is the political, how do we do that work? And so that was that caution feminists at work. And one of the ways that we've been engaging with that um, in the organizations that we work in has the term is experiential servicing. And that has been around how do we experience, how do we surface the inner experiences of the members of the organization in the normal course of everyday action? So how do we make check-ins? How do we make meetings? How do we make engagements, a space where people can bring more than just their programmatic selves, more than just their roles and responsibilities um, of what's expected of them, but actually what is happening in their broader political environment, what is happening in their broader social environment that impacts the work that they do and makes them better at what they do. Um, and that's not just emotions, that's our inner lives, like our ideas and our intuitions. What are our fears, um, whether it's personal or political or more broadly social? What are our values and our memories that lend to the work and the deepening of the work? Uh, maybe leaning into what Jessica was saying earlier about upsetting who knows best, because this is not just managers sharing this. This is how does the organization as a whole make space for these conversations to happen? And so we gave some examples in the article exploring how um, a sex worker organization in South Africa was exploring and making sure that there was space to surface what the organizational members needed. So the fact that majority of them were women, the fact that majority of them were also acting as, were also doing sex work. Therefore, how does the organization respond to those complexities, to those experiences, making sure that one Friday every month is open so that people can go and do their banking. And it became as simple as that, that once you created space for the opening and the surfacing of experiences, the organization was able to respond um, to what justice feels like for this community of people, for this organization of people. Um, and therefore making that organization feel more responsive to the environment of what those people needed and therefore living the purpose. And the biggest kind of warning around it, which has come up a lot and I think uh, resonates a lot in many of the meetings we've attended in a lot of the work that we do is the idea of a form trap. And that is where there's a disconnection between the intended experience of the practice or the process or the um, yeah, the objective of that meeting and how people actually experience it. So the amount of kind of discussions we've had, I, I, the way I explain it is I usually do a kind of exercise where I say, imagine two meetings. And in one meeting, uh, everyone's sitting on the floor and there's a dog chilling there and everyone's eating and they're all kind of having an open plan, open session meeting. And you can, there's a, there's a look, that people are all engaged and there's a conversation. And then in another meeting room, uh, there's desks and everyone's sitting behind the desks and everyone's at their laptops and it looks very formal and it looks, and I'll ask the question, which meeting feels more inclusive? Which meeting feels more just? And at the end of the day, the experience of the people in the room, the experience of those who are sitting behind the laptops or those who are sitting on the floor with the dogs, it's completely dependent on the experience of that space, of what people are bringing on into that space, of the power dynamics involved in that space that will be able to answer that question. And so whether we get stuck in the form trap of saying, oh, well, if we have a flat structure for our organization, or, oh, if we have an open meeting where everyone can speak and we have an open agenda, or so we sometimes fall into these form traps where a, the, the idea of a form will lead to a certain outcome or will lead to a feeling of inclusion or a feeling of equality or a feeling of justice and how we use experiential surfacing to ensure that that form meets its intended outcome or its intended experience. Uh, so Isha and I kind of wanted to present this and wanted to explore this uh, recognizing that most of our organizations have either been community-based or they've been locally based and what does this mean in a corporate space or what does this mean in an international development organization space where hierarchies are much deeper where this ability to surface in the things there might not be as much space for it but we're wondering if this kind of invitation to bring more of ourselves into the spaces that we work would be part of the kind of challenging of where we feel things are rigid or where we feel like there's no space that we can start playing with that and seeing 
where they might be. Um, and Michelle and I had a conversation earlier this morning and she just said beautifully, can we bring all our humanity to work? And what does that require from us? And I really enjoyed that provocation. So I'll maybe leave it there. Wonderful. Thanks, Ella. It's, uh, it's, yeah, I really love the way that you explore these questions in, in the piece. I really invite people to look at it afterwards. Obviously, we'll share the details of how you can do that. Um, but yeah, then please do uh, post any questions you've got for Ella. We'll come back to questions after. I'm going to introduce Alex now. Hi, Alex. Um, <laughs> how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. So Alex Martins is a researcher, facilitator and advocate, passionate about reforming the international development sector by creating greater equity between the global south and north. Born in Johannesburg, she was raised in South Africa and Brazil and is currently based in London. And her article in the journal is called Reimagining Equity, Redressing Power Imbalances Between the Global North and the Global South. Welcome, Alex. Thank you very much, Marianne. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, you're good. You're good. Fantastic. So I, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted to share this panel with so many impressive and inspiring women that I've personally been following for a while. So thank you for this opportunity. And also I hope that you're all well and safe wherever you are in the world. I know that um, I feel anxious in this time. So I'm, I'm very glad to have this as an opportunity to distract myself and to, to engage in some learning, collective learning. So I actually want to start with a very short anecdote about the time that I tried to write an article about reimagining international development uh, and didn't. So the first article that I, the first version of, of the article that I wrote for this edition actually focused very narrowly on the concept of equity. So that was always the theme between global north and global south, but within the very specific context of policy coherence for sustainable development or PCSD for those of you that work in this area. It's pretty much captured in Sustainable Development Goal 17 on partnership. So rather than seek to reimagine the system, I actually ended up focusing on a very small tweak within it. So I was really grateful to Caroline and Marianne for the chance to basically redo it and write the article that I really wanted to write all along. Um, and that genuinely allowed me to think beyond the system we currently have and try to outline something new. But the reason I share this anecdote is just to illustrate, uh, at least for me personally, how difficult it can be when you're in the weeds of delivering development programs or doing development research, just how difficult it is to lift your head above the parapet, you know, and almost go back to first principles thinking, you know, why does the development ex system exist in the way that it does? Who created the system? For what purposes? Who benefits? Who doesn't? Um, I find that those questions get lost in the day to day of my work. So we ended up with the article we now have. And basically I stated at the beginning that equity is basically a concept that always seems to be used in global development frameworks as something that the global north does to or in the global south, rather than as something we should strive for between north and south as a way of redressing power imbalances. So Ella, it kind of reminds me of what you've just said actually about, we talk about justice out there, we talk about inclusion and equity out there, but what's happening within organizations. So I think the same parallel can be drawn to the system as a whole. Um, and the way we conceptualize you know, equity in terms of development interventions in the South clearly just does not take into account the complex colonial um, and patriarchal histories that exist between so-called donor and so-called recipient countries. So I wanted to reframe this as a universal concept. And the article is, is pretty much uh, based on my experiences as a researcher and practitioner um, who's originally from the Global South, um, but has practiced development in the Global North. And in many ways, I feel I've been co-opted by this system, uh, which probably explains why it was hard to write the, the, the article I meant to write in the first instance. Now, let me start with the definition of equity because I get that question a lot. And to be honest, it's very challenging. I don't think there is a universal definition of equity because it means different things in different contexts and far be it from me to provide the gold standard definition. So what it means in the purposes of the article is um, that creating greater equity basically refers to a process of leveling the playing field um, by taking into account the root causes that underpin the inequality we see in the development sector. So therefore, if true equality is the desired end state, equity is a means by which to achieve this universal goal. And that includes through a fairer distribution of global resources, 
and the creation of more equitable partnerships. So a slightly long-winded definition, but I think we need to be as all-encompassing as possible. And so in the article itself, I explore what I call several dimensions of equity. And I find that that's actually a better way to come at this issue rather than a two sentence definition, which is a bit sort of stale. Uh, and so I start by looking at cross cutting dimensions of equity. And in my view, those should be racial and gender equity. Now, I just don't have time to do either of those concepts justice in this presentation or even really in the article. They deserve separate, you know, articles in their own right. But I wanted to make really clear from the beginning of this presentation that I see these two elements as absolutely essential ingredients if we are to achieve North South or universal equity. So, racial equity, again, kind of going back to Ella's point, I mean, you know, it should be applied both within or across Northern development organizations, but also between North and South. I want to briefly quote Dr. Rob Tommy Jai Paley the Liberian academic and activist, and she says, in its crudest form, development has traditionally been about dissecting the political, socioeconomic, and cultural processes of black, brown, and other subjects of color in the so-called global south, and finding them regressive, particularly in comparison to the so-called progressive global north. I thought that quote could better encapsulate anything I have to say. Um, but equally, gender equity, um, not only from a you know, intra-North or intra-South perspective, but from a North-South perspective, is, is equally important given that inequitable policies, especially inequitable economic policies, disproportionately affect Southern women and girls. We know this. This is what the evidence tell, tells us. And so to quote a uh, feminist theorist, uh, Serene J. Carter, she states, post-colonial feminists have argued that Westerners, are invested in an idea of themselves as modern. In other words, morally advanced and distant, distanced from tradition. If tradition causes hierarchy and Western cultures have transcended tradition, then sexism primarily exists in other backward cultures. So I think again, that, that encapsulated, encapsulates it better than I could. And I just think that understanding the implications of that and the earlier points on racial equity is crucial. So with that framing in mind, I'll move on to basically four dimensions of equity that I frame in the article. Um, and, and really here I'm talking about equity more as a way of working, a practice in the development sector. So I'll cover four uh, very briefly. Language. The way we use language in the, in the global north can reinforce existing power dynamics and hierarchies. Language is powerful. Language is not incidental. And it can further entrench the idea that, oh, equity is something that happens over there not something that happens, you know, something that happens in the global north or with a universal application. So I'm sure everybody on this um, presentation will have terms that they prefer or terms that they don't use. I explain in the article that I don't use personally the terms developed and developing. I don't use the term the field. I don't use the term beneficiaries. I certainly don't use the term expatriates including to describe myself, I'm an immigrant in London, let's be clear. Um, and I only use the term local in very specific circumstances. So, um, and, and I think everybody has the right to use the terminology they want to use, but these are terms that I think don't um, have equitable connotations and explain why in the, in the article. I do use global north and south, and we can discuss that later. And I would love to hear in the comments some terms that you may have stopped using or started using. The second dimension of equity following language is knowledge production. And this, I mean, I could basically just quote what Jessica Horn was saying earlier, uh, but it's the idea that international actors operate a monopoly, not only on knowledge production, but also um, on determining what types of knowledge are valued above others. I've seen that very, very often um, working as a researcher, you know, and commissioning research. And there's just this presumption of Northern superiority um, which affects, it really affects what research is commissioned, who designs the research, who implements the research, who benefits from it, and how it's used to inform decision making. So knowledge production in its current form is gen generally inequitable, and we need to redress that imbalance. The third element is funding. This is where the rubber hits the road <laughs> in many ways. And I see two kind of main dimensions to the question of funding inequity. So first of all, I think we have to grapple with the inherently extractive nature and origin of Northern wealth. Where does this money come from? But then the second dimension today, which is much more of a current dynamic, is the paucity of funding that goes directly to Southern organizations. I mean, the most recent re research tells us that 0.4% humanitarian funding goes directly to Southern organizations. 
that couldn't be further from, from equitable, right? And it's an idea we talk, this is a commonly known fact, and yet, you know, it's, it's a very difficult dynamic to subvert. Uh, and there's a great quote by Jason Hickel, who's an anthropologist that I'm sure many of you follow. He says, the idea of aid overrides any suggestion that Western powers are in any way complicit in the suffering of the South. Indeed, aid stands as irrefutable proof of Western benevolence. So unless we can kind of challenge that fundamental idea, we're not going to have equitable funding systems. And the fourth uh, final dimension following from that, I've just sort of labeled as a catch-all partnerships. It's the new buzzword or one of the new buzzwords in development. Everyone has equitable partnership. Um, it's part of the vision and mission statements of organizations. Um, so what does it really mean? And I think the phrase, you know, nothing about us without us, which has been used by many different people in different concepts, um, in co different concept, contexts, sorry, to essentially express what an inequitable partnership feels like. So again, I go back to Ello, what you're saying at the end, these are feelings. And I think inequity is also a feeling. If you've experienced it, you know. And decisions are really made from the outside in this sort of top-down manner. And um, I, I dance sometimes, and I kind of think of it uh, in, in Latin dancing. So I kind of think of it in, in the way that development is the sort of dance that we have in which the South is always destined to follow the lead of the North. And that's just how it is. Um, whereas in my view, truly equitable partnerships need to be inverted. They need to be Southern led. They need to be not imposed, not based on assumptions of what the South needs. They're respectful of the right to say no to an intervention. Can, can country governments or communities ever refuse the, the, the you know, being recipients of aid? Um, and they should, these equitable partnerships should be consistently aware of historical power imbalances for all the reasons that I talked about earlier. So, you know, in summary, to reimagine international development, we need to place equity at the heart of all of these different dimensions, the racial equity dimension, gender equity, language, knowledge production, funding, partnerships. But also, I think, how do we get there? <laughs> and I think one small but important factor is that we start to measure how equitable organizations and partnerships really are. And so just to share very briefly, I'm currently working on an initiative with a group of people called the Equity Index. And it, it basically aims to do that. It aims to measure both the internal and external practices of UK development organizations. And that way we can assess how equitable they are over time. Uh, so where do we go from here? I have absolutely no good answers and I don't consider myself to be an expert on any of these issues. Um, but I think, and our next speaker is at the heart of this, I think it really needs a wholesale mindset and cultural shift and we really need to shift and give up power. Um, in order for all of this to be at all feasible. And I, I'll leave it there and I really look forward to the discussion. In the, the questions. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. There's um, a really lively discussion about different terms going on um, in the chat. So please feel free to continue that. Um, if you want to, if you want to, well, um, I introduce our last speaker to you, who is Jenny. Let me see if I can get Jenny off mute. Jenny. Hi. Hello. There you are. <laughs> nice to see you. So just a, a, an intro for those listening. So um, Jenny Hodgson has been the executive director of the Johannesburg based Global Fund for Community Foundations since it was established in 2006. She's overseen its emergence as a leading global voice on community philanthropy as a core strategy for people led development and for shifting power closer to the ground. She's board member of the African Philanthropy Network, the European Foundation Centre and a trustee of Comet Relief. And her article in the journal is called Disrupting and Democratising Development, Community Philanthropy as Theory and Practice. So welcome, Jenny. Thank you, Marianne. Um, I apologise, I had to move outside because to get a 4G signal because our Wi-Fi <coughs> wasn't working. So you may hear <coughs> traffic passing by, but um, as everything is closing down here in Johannesburg, there maybe shouldn't be too much of that. <laughs> um, but let's see how we go. Um, well, firstly, I'd say um, it's great to be on this call. Um, I kept on getting kicked out and you've reached maximum capacity of number of people to be on this call, Marianne. So well Sorry done on that. that. Sorry about that. <laughs> There's a lot of people uh, who suddenly had more time on their hands. Um, I was really happy to be able to write this article because it came at a moment where 
I, I, I needed to go through the pain and agony of what it takes to write an article, give it enough thought and, and meet a deadline um, in my own, my own thinking, I suppose. So I, I thank you for the, for the agony and the ecstasy of that, <laughs> Caroline, Marianne. Um, so this article, um, as Marianne said, really focuses on the growing field of community philanthropy, which um, I've been working in this space for the last 13 years, working with a range of organizations around the world, community foundations, women's funds, community development foundations, environmental funds, um, all of which were sort of existing at the margins of the international development space. Um, they were considered to be nice, but not essential as drivers of, of some kind of structural change. And um, these organizations do two things which distinguish them from other parts um, of much of Southern civil society, certainly, or Southern civil, or Southern civil society that has been able to rely on external development aid for a period of time, I suppose. Um, and that uh, part, part of what I talk about in the ar article is I think this growing sense that so much of civil society has been co-opted by international development funding, that organizations look, what they need to look, look like what they need to look like to access funding perhaps um, rather than to what they need to look like to be kind of owned and accountable to the communities that they serve. And these organizations do the two things that they do. Is one is building local philanthropy and talking about the local role of local assets and local resources. And the second is many of them use grant making as a development tool. And previously, this has been seen as, as quite charming and lovely, but ultimately irrelevant to the kind of big you know, macho masculinist development aid, which is, you know, multi-million dollar budgets and linear growth and wahaha kind of <laughs> approach to success. Um, and I think in our own thinking, we've seen the emergence of a set of practices um, and organizations around the world um, over the last um, 20 years, I suppose, uh, uh, many of which are partners of the Global Fund for Community Foundation. And um, in the last few years, we'd started to work with um, a cohort to, to look particularly at the, the, the role and, of, of things like measurements and impacts of a, what seemed to be a rather small set of organizations who were entirely invisible to mainstream development. And so we invited um, partners to apply to be part of an action learning program to look at the nature, the fabric, the essence of the work that community philanthropy organizations were doing around the world, and particularly the question of, of measurement and impact. And I can see that um, um, one of the partners, Shuba Chako from the Bangalore-based Solidarity Foundation, which is an LGBTQI foundation, was part of this learning group, is on the call as well. So um, what we started to look at with this group was um, how do we understand the impacts of our work? the sort of processes behind the, the small grants, what, what happens when somebody gives for their own development when they haven't given before, the kind of nature of behavior change. Um, and looking at the sort of framing, which is uh, a quote which I like from um, David Fleming, which was large scale problems do not require large scale solutions. They require small scale solutions within a large scale framework. And so starting to see this emergence of a set of organizations around the world, many of which were being led or set up by people who'd worked in mainstream development and were choosing to step out to create something new, I think was a particular focus of, of our interest. So this learning group um, of 15, 16 partners met twice over two years to really start looking at the nature of, of their practice and how they were thinking about their work and how they were thinking about things like power, ownership, accountability, transparency. So the article I've framed in the, in the following way, which is firstly to say, this is an emerging sector and international development needs to be aware of it. We know from all, a lot of the literature that um, Development is as much about how people feel about themselves, the relationships between them, their ability to exercise um, their own uh, interests, to be heard, to be seen, as much as it is about flows of money. Too often development aid has been seen as a proxy for just large flows of money. And that secondly, um, Alex mentioned that the horrible statistic of the 0.4% or whatever it is of how little funding goes directly to the global south, that in a sense, the rerouting of funding from Global North to Global South is indeed an essential part of it, but in itself it is not sufficient. Until we are able to see 
um, appreciate, dignify the role of local resources um, as a proxy for participation and ownership. And so understanding that um, a contribution you know, of $10 from somebody in a community who's never given before matters much more in terms of its value, say, than you know, $100,000 from an external agent, uh, funder or whatever. So we look, I look in the article uh, at the emergence of community philanthropy as something that's important to see and understand and perhaps requires a different ways of seeing and understanding what growth, distributed growth, scale, what, uh, the, um, the non-typical the non idea of scale meaning organizational growth. So the idea of networked growth um, uh, and networked kind of scale. But also some of the pains right at the, at the moment in the, in the formal side of the development sector. So the aid to the me to the, the issues about how large NGOs and big parts of the system have themselves been unable to, you know, they've become centers of power and uh, abusers of power in many instances. And what happens when organizations get too big and they start to confuse their own success with that of the work that they're doing, but also how this is creating a dynamic between um, civil society in the global north and global south when perhaps INGOs are talking the language of solidarity but they are also coming into countries and fundraising in those countries and competing with southern civil society or they're choosing not to be political um, because they don't want to get kicked out of a country and so they can carry on funding programs and so are they you know is are they starting to undermine some parts of more activist southern civil society so there is a sense of a pain and an opportunity in the formal side of the development system um, and the second half of the article really starts to look at three components that across this um, diversity of 16 organizations, which range in size from an organization that was a year old with an annual budget of $5,000 to um, one whose annual budget is over $2 million. In a sense, size didn't really matter. It was really to look at the ways that these organizations were thinking about their work. And that the data we've collected through our grant making over the past 13 years understands community philanthropy both as a form of and a force for community development. It's a way to bring people into the development um, process. It's it, as against in the, the sort of formal development sector with an INGOs, you've got fundraising and then you've got programs. There's something, a sort of circular logic about being someone who can give and receive. And when you give collectively that it creates new spaces and opportunities for people to come together, um, creates bonding social capital and bridging social capital. Um, and so to, uh, we looked at the three dimensions that we've highlight, highlighted in the article, which is that community philanthropy does three things. It builds assets, it talks about assets, it starts to dream the impossible dream of civil society starting to think that it is allowed to grow long-term assets, not just to live project to project, and that there is a power to community-owned assets which can be deployed to address different kinds of community needs over time. We define community in multiple ways in the article. Community defined by geography, so some of these organizations are place-based. Community um, defined by identity, so women's funds, LGBTQI funds, and community divide, um, defined by issues. So we've got a couple of environmental funds. One is a biosphere reserve in the cohort too. So beyond assets, these organizations are also building capacities, and the most of them are using grant making as a strategy to get resources to the front lines of civil society. So they're using a grant making as a development tool, not as something that somebody else has asked them to do on their behalf. But the idea of actually getting resources into the system as close as to the ground as possible. And um, in turn, themselves choosing to remain relatively small as organizations, which is again, a bit out of kilter with the normal, um, so, you know, size of the idea of growth meaning success. So the more staff you have, the more successful you, have, you are. And the final um, aspect of their work, which I think really shows shone through is the idea that these organizations are doing development work. They are making grants, they're raising money, but actually what this is all really about is building trust. It's about modeling behaviors that bring people closer together, whether it's on the giving side or the organizing side or the implementation side, that there's something around building trust between within communities, between communities, and also how that in turn can translate into communities beginning moving from having trust to actually starting to express rights and claim rights from power holders. So you sort of see the beginnings of linking social capital when communities start to feel confident 
joined up, connected, and that they have resources actually to, to bring to the table, that that actually starts to qualitatively change how they engage with power holders. And finally, I would say, I think one of the things that really struck me, which I hadn't really appreciated before and still, um, so we, we'd had these two meetings of partners. I used data from um, grants, uh, applications and reports. And then I conducted interviews with everyone um, who was participating in the group. And what really struck me was how preoccupied these organ organizations are with their own power and how this is a really defining characteristic of what happens if you are emerging from a social movement or from a particular context and you start to have resources and you can start to make grants and you're starting to talk to others with power who maybe potentially are donors, there is a danger that you move further and further away from those whom you are meant to be serving or, or where you came from. And there was just some really lovely language and thinking around how you can start to be, you know, how organizations articulated their own power and the extent to which they use strategies to, do, to recognize it, but also to flatten it. So things like participatory grant making, um, radical transparency on audits, so inviting community members to come in and look through books themselves. Um, and it, it felt like this really kind of sweet but hidden nugget of really, really sharp um, and thoughtful insight from a group of organizations who really are organizing at, at the edges. So my, my conclusion was that, hey, big development, um, there's something going on here and you may need to use different kinds of lenses to see it. But I think at these times, um, these last few days even, as you're starting to see the, the emergence of, of citizens organizing, mutual, mutuality, community organizing, that really the sort of power of people joining up and helping each other and working together, I think is really important. And too often we've become so preoccupied with power money and access to money um, and looking like what we need to do to access the next chunk of money, we've almost lost sight of that. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Jenny. I want to. I'm going to invite um, all the panelists to ha uh, have their videos on. Um, and uh, yeah, hi. <laughs> so people can see us all again. We're going to move to um, questions now. Um, I've, I've got a few questions um, that people have asked during in the chat. Um, but we're also welcoming other questions and you, you might want to ask questions to everyone or you might want to ask individual questions so um, feel free to put more questions in the chat and I'm also going to I'm going to unmute people and see how it goes <laughs> so that you'd be able to ask questions yeah I'm going to unmute everybody and when I do that you can all re -mute yourself Maybe that's too much. I think that's too much. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow people to unmute themselves. <laughs> so that's what I've done. So I've muted you all again, but you can now unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, so, um, so, so yeah, because I'm muting everyone. That, 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 that was a really interesting cacophony of noise, <laughs> but I think there's probably too much. Um, Jessica, are you there? Um, there's a couple of questions during your presentation. Yeah. I, I think I, I think I found them. Oh, you picked I them out. Got, yeah, but I did. Okay. Um, the first was about, um, so Natasha Lewis was asking about, um, her, her question was really focused on how do we work with collective cultures and peoples and generate healing when we have restrictive movement, obviously in the mm -hmm. context of COVID-19 and everything that's being closed down and social isolation right now. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that that feel really pertinent right now. Yeah, I mean, I suppose this is now when we actually value um, the presence of social media and the ability to communicate through ICTs. So I just think like if there's a group of people who give you a lot of life and they feel the same, maybe you could set up a, a little group, however you communicate on whatever platform you use and you could just send each other affirming things, nice songs, playlists, you know, things to do. Um, in this time, I think it is strange because it's almost like the idea that the enemy is the other. And I think that public health has been insensitive a little bit um, in terms of how some of this, this has been framed. Um, and so I think we can kind of take that power back and understand that it's just the flu. 
um, that we can catch, but that um, either the people who have it or the people who potentially pass it to us are not in and of themselves the source of danger. And so I think that we can maybe do something that's about sort of, yeah, just spending a bit of time with the people who, who give you life, like I said, um, and just sharing positive, you know, positive vibes and insight and things you enjoy with them. I think everybody could appreci appreciate it. Because I've engaged in contexts of risk and crisis, I don't get very stressed in the face of, of this sort of thing, but the environment around is so stressful, like I can't even buy toilet paper, <laughs> that actually it starts to impact on you too. So I think we can just be aware that everybody's actually getting into this zone just because it's sort of been created and just actively try and do positive things with each other and for each other. For sure. And there was one, another question from Ezzy. Um, can you elaborate a bit more on livelihood therapy and how imp impactful has it been? Sure. So there's just briefly, there's an example that's actually in the article um, to give it flesh. Um, so um, at Pansy Hospital, actually, they have an intervention where they do kind of holistic um, therapeutic support for the women survivors and a piece of it. Um, so they do they provide psychological support, but they also have income generating activities. So um, when the, the chief um, surgeon, um, Dr. Mukwege, um, faced an assassination attempt um, and they actually killed his guard um, and um, he had to flee the country. And, um, and so the women, as soon as they heard that he had been attacked, um, they literally walked his patients. They walked sometimes from two hours, three hours away to come and find out what had happened. The United Nations and all of the security forces and what have you that were around didn't even turn up at the door, but these women came. Um, he had to flee the country. And so uh, they said, we need to have him back. So they started, um, harvesting produce from the fields that were part of these economic income generating activities to go and sell them in the market to raise money for his air ticket to come back to Congo. And so for me, that's an example about how um, an economic, in building economic agency also enables people's political agency because otherwise they actually wouldn't have the money to be able to kind of crowdfund, locally crowdfund as it were, um, to, to, to do that and to make that offering. So I think that that's very significant. And I think that there are some of those sort of moments that we often don't capture um, or don't know about or hear about, but I think are very significant in expressions of political agency that can come out of economic agency. Right. Yeah. Thanks, Jessica. I, I, I'm going to ask a question um, to everyone. Um, this, the idea of decolonizing knowledge, which Jessica spoke to initially, but other people have picked up on. I, I, I wanted to ask a kind of maybe slightly practical oriented question about that and thinking about people listening and, 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 and let's, let's describe ourselves as practitioners for now, knowing that there's all kinds of people on this call, but how can practitioners, how do you think practitioners can help that process of decolonizing knowledge to happen in their kind of day-to-day -day engagement with their work, with the people around them? And I'd give everyone a <laughs> chance to respond to that. So Jessica, you're on, so if you want to. <laughs> okay. So I think um, firstly to just pay more attention to what knowledge you consider to be authoritative um, and to ask yourself some questions about that. The second I think is to read more widely. And when I say read, I mean read books, but also listening because there's lots of texts out there not just written ones. And so think about if you realize that actually all your reference points for understanding the work come from certain types of knowledge producers, maybe rethink that. Like I said, the citational, uh, the citational practice that I used um, um, with this article was intentional. And I thank Sky Chirapi who's on this call and some other of my feminist psychology friends, African feminist psychology friends who sent references, actively trying to make sure that the reference list had text that we don't always read when we're thinking about this. Ritu, I think you're my... Oh, sorry, Jessica. Sorry, Jessica, I just muted you because... <laughs> It's fine. You muted Sorry. everybody. I muted everyone because there's too much other noise coming. Sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, and then and again to just think about if you think about you know where are the greatest sources of wisdom in your life, and then think about 
the extent to which you tend to bring them into your work. So some people might say, actually, it's my grandmother. If I think about wisdom, my grandmother had some of the best wisdom. To what extent do you bring some of that into the ways that you plan, you know, your program planning or what have you? Is some of that wisdom or, or you're using, you know, smart frameworks and things that come out of, you know, Microsoft and whatever. What, do you, what, are, you, what are you using in your work? Um, and I think just as that critical interrogation and then, and then starting to, to access other knowledges and validate other knowledges actively and, and how you talk mm -hmm. in the things that you cite and the material that you send around in the things that you write and in the ways that you do the work. Mm. Yes. Uh, maybe I can add, thank you so much, Jessica. I feel like that was um, a perfect uh, foundation. And in terms of what happened in South Africa during Fees Must Fall, where the students were demanding uh, decolonizing of education, they were thinking about fees, they were thinking about how do we as students see ourselves within an education system that is elitist, uh, that only views and deems certain types of knowledge as legitimate, as, um, as important. Uh, some of their questions around what is education and what is knowledge was also building on what Jessica was saying in terms of who is in the room, um, who is invited into these spaces and, and the knowledges that we bring with us. So if we were th to think more deeply about our own histories, our personal histories, uh, our country's histories, our community's histories, and how we draw on those knowledges um, when we're in our practices, whether that's how you do an introduction into a meeting um, and what kind of reflexive practices you might use, um, being a little more creative or a little more innovative about how we bring in other types. Um, and when we were talking about academic writing, we asked a mutual friend of ours, actually her art is up on the wall here. Her name is Natasha Valley, an amazing, amazing um, feminist activist in South Africa, uh, and asked her to produce some art uh, with us for the article, giving her an art, a chance to take a look, to engage with us around what does it mean to write this work, to do this work. So thinking creatively about what other forms do we want to use, whether it's art or dance or movement, um, and that these are also a form of knowledge in terms of how we embody our histories and how we embody our lives. So imagine, I mean, we, do, we know that in meetings we do a lot of like body breaks and those kinds of things and drawing on different types of knowledge in when, how we manifest those things and how we experiment with our body. So just wanted to add that. Lovely, thanks. Hello. Alex and Jenny, would you like to add? Alex. Yeah, I'm happy to add really briefly just to say that um, this is a live question for me as a white person and also someone who is, did higher education in the Global North and has worked exclusively in the sector here. So, I mean, I'm learning much more from the responses that I can give, but I did want to give a plug for um, PopWorks Africa. They have a course on decolonization and racism, dismantling racism in the development sector. It's led by Stephanie Kimu. Um, and I'm learning a lot from that. So I'm only halfway through, so I'll probably have more to share in a couple of months. Um, but I think a practical step that we can take, um, having worked in the consultancy research sector, is um, we need more transparency on research supply chains, which will, you know, is the first step to stopping the local organization, whatever that means. They could be a regional or national large-scale data collection African organization, we call them local, whoever that, that organization is. There needs to be transparency in the supply chain so that basically the funding doesn't trickle from the international slash northern consultancy through to, you know, consultants through to this organization who's basically relegated to doing data collection or, for example, in scientific research, um, providing lab facilities, you know, and then it's the white experts who come in and say, well, like the virus now is a good example. You know, the white experts will come in and say, well, this is this is our knowledge, completely erasing community knowledge and other forms of knowledge. So. That's just one practical step that I think is, is crucial in the, the research slash consultancy sector. Jenny, do you want to add? Um, yes, I, I mean, we've become, um, I think, increasingly strategic and tactical about this particular issue. I mean, building on what everyone has said before about the, just the general framing of, of knowledge and, you know, where it comes from and who owns it. But you know, one of the challenges that we've found as the Global Fund for Community Foundations, which has invested a lot of time and effort in, in producing and, uh, data with our partners and research and, and, you know, done loads and loads of writing, and yet it is all dismissed as, as grey literature because it hasn't been peer-reviewed. And, um, in fact, what was pleasant to write about writing this article was that you kind of got it, 
Whereas the last peer reviewed article I got, it was just clear that the people who peer reviewed it just came from a completely different planet. So the questions they were asking, which was like, how do you monitor and evaluate it? And I'm going, what? We don't, we're talking about emergence here. And so actually trying to both kind of get behind the tap of, of knowledge into, you know, in, into the wall behind to say, actually, unless we start finding ways to get, um, you know, one of the strategies is to get more stuff peer reviewed. Another has been to try and close the gap between research and practice. So working with partners, encouraging partners to document and research and kind of riff around their own practice and then um, be supportive in writing. Because I think there's a lot of a lack of, of confidence around how, you know, people writing in English, English tends to be the, the predominant language. There's a lot of jargon and people feel reluctant to actually put themselves out there and, you know, offer that to the world. So supporting people to write. And then a couple of other projects where we've been, we're working with with the partners, again, the Solidarity Foundation is on this call, is one of these actually doing where, where our partners are leading the research and the value is added is when they start you know, doing the, the work in a non-extractive way, so they're not providing it for someone else, but actually trying to create cross-learning between those that are doing it. Because I think there's a real missing piece systemically about who comes in and decides what's knowledge and, and, and how it's valued and appreciated. So starting to think really quite pragmatically about how we can plug some of the holes in the, the system and close some of the gaps too. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, Caroline wants to come in on this as well. Are you there, Caroline? Yeah, I am, yes. Oh, we can see you and hear you. That's brilliant. Yeah, you can. Yeah, I actually <laughs> exist as a perfectly embodied woman. Um, yeah, so yes. Um, so much of this speaks to what the journal does, um, obviously, and we've been running, as uh, we're called it technically, you know, on Routledge's website, a peer reviewed journal. Our peer reviewing, as Jenny uh, says, uh, we've worked very hard to square a circle here. We're viewed as peer reviewing. We have a proper impact factor, which is actually quite a good impact factor um, now, uh, which is important for the journal to have uh, a life um, which is sustainable as a journal and that's where how we how we get into places in people's hands when they're using the journal to influence um, but actually the peer reviewing for us uh, is proper peers for the kind of journal it is so we are actually having activists and practitioners peer reviewing the articles so that's why they're not asking you know the questions that Jenny you found inappropriate with other journals um, it's a question of, I think, of trying to sort of smash through a lot of the intellectual, um, intellectual um, what, sort of barbed wire around what, a, what, what knowledge is. Um, and to, to, to challenge, you know, there's a lot of emperor's new clothes, to use that idiom, you know, where you imagine that there's something that's really, really important and significant. Uh, and in fact, it's actually irrelevant to what you're trying to do. So, you know, um, a normal peer reviewing process would be double blind. And I've actually just had a conversation with the people who are about to edit our health issue with me. Um, one of them, the guest editors who are health specialists, uh, thought that perhaps we should uh, not know who the ideas for the issue uh, come from when we're commissioning and I said actually for us it's actually really important we do know who they are because what we're committed to in this journal is publishing the knowledge which is the most um, the most experts because I, I like the word expert but it's, to, it's not to do with not liking experts but to, to acknowledge that the expert knowledge on this this subject is not going to be coming from people who are conventionally seen as experts. Uh, we want to know who they are because if they're from the University of Cambridge, we probably won't publish it because we know they'll have opportunities elsewhere. We want to find the people who actually perhaps never thought that they could write for a journal. And as I said at the beginning, uh, perhaps thought it was totally irrelevant. Um, and, and actually many people feel it's politically quite dodgy to be writing for a journal because you're propping up all of the emperor's new clothes around, around knowledge. So we're trying to, um, we're trying to square a circle here and actually run a project which pragmatically, uh, pragmatically understands the importance of this kind of publishing to get you into the, your, your influencing spaces. But actually, it, you know, it's doing it for people who, who wouldn't ha ever have got through those doors in a, in a, a journal that uh, obeys the conventions. 
and somehow we're squaring the circle, we're, we're going to keep doing it. I think probably this journal, this issue was the most inspiring I've ever edited because I actually feel this is the closest to, to the vision that I've always had for it, where we've been able to be quite radical. And I mean, Ella, Ella wanted a, wanted a picture and uh, in her article and in journal terms you don't have illustrations you know it, it's just not not heard of and 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 she pushed that door and i said fine because you know i, I get it um and thankfully we have a publisher that, that that lets us do it and i shall shut up in a second but i'm excited because <laughs> you can see me um basically that you know the the fact that all of our articles and our free access via our, our own website um, is something that a lot of activists feel is impossible because they don't think they'll find a journals publisher that will let them do it. And we have got a great partnership with Routledge who, who basically provided they sell, they sell the right amount of, of our content to people who actually can afford it in conventional academic libraries and big, big foundations. They're happy to let us actually distribute it among activists and NGOs. Oh, there's a cat. Jenny's got a cat. <laughs> I just saw a cat walk, walk across Jenny's thing. Anyway. Um, Caroline, while yeah. you're on, t tell people how they access the article. Okay, it's right, yes. I'm supposed to in any way, so it's yeah. the perfect moment. <laughs> All right, okay. So to access the articles, um, if you can afford it, if you work for a wealthy organisation or a conventional academic institution, please, uh, when you go to the website, our website, which I will give you the address for in a minute, please take a look at the Routledge subscription. Uh, there we have a, a lower low price subscription for low and middle income countries. If you can afford it, please do buy it. Otherwise the wheels fall off our project um, because it is run by Oxfam as a development project. We're not profit. Um, and so while Routledge, Routledge, Routledge published us as a journal, they make a profit and they plow it back to us in royalties. We have, you know, like I say, it's a good model. But if you can't afford this, like, like most of, of most activists and most of the people we're publishing this for can't, then you can get all the, the articles free access. There is, um, you can either go directly to the Oxfam policy and practice website, um, or you can uh, go for some of the articles from the issue, we'll have live links directly through from our own website. All of the instructions for this are on our own website. So that's where I'd tell everybody to go. Um, it sounds like a slightly uh, convoluted and clunky message, but that's because we actually have to make sure that um, the route is, is, is slightly clunky by design. Otherwise, Routledge feel everybody would, you know, would simply just go straight to the website and nobody would buy it. So persevere, it's easy. It is, I promise you it's easy. Um, our website, is, I'm going to put it in the chat box, but it's www.genderanddevelopment.org. We've got an issue blog, Marianne and I have, have written. Uh, we've got a, an issue page. We have, um, the, the speakers today have got all, their live links go straight through to their articles. With the others, you can, you can look at what's in the issue on our website and then go to Oxfam Policy and Practice. Um, if you Google that, you'll get it. Um, and we've got click through links on the yeah. site. Yeah, so I've put the links up there. Basically, if you go to policy and practice and you, and you look for the article, you'll then find it free access is, is yes. the message. If and you... they all appear, they actually yeah. all appear in a, in a block. So if you go through to one, you'll see the others in the issue, actually all on the, on the same screen in the policy and practice site. So it is, it, it is easy. It sounds ver a bit verbose, but it's easy. Yeah. Um, so, so thanks, Caroline, for sharing that with us. Okay. I, 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 there was one more question I wanted to ask, and then I'm going br to bring us to a close as I do it, because it's coming towards um, midday. So. Um, uh, someone asked, and I can't remember who it was now, but I just copied the question, are there any studies or analysis of what needs to be done for a shifting culture of giving, uh, a shifting culture of giving, reducing dependency and saying no to un unhelpful or even dangerous funding? And I think it came probably during Jenny's talk, that question from someone, I'm sorry, whoever it was, I can't remember who you were. But, um, Jenny, do you want, I want to invite everyone to close out. And I, but I thought, Jenny, I'd, I'd ask you that question as I do. Um, but it, so is there, a, is there, are there social analysis that you're aware of around that idea of saying no to and reducing dependency? 
first of all. Oh, you're mute. Unmute, yes. There you are. <laughs> um, I think it's very much in the space around the kind of general hashtag shift the power conversation, which is that it's not just power between external donors and local organizations. It's also, if you're starting to mobilize local resources, power at a local level too. And I think so that the, you know, there, there is on our website, um, globalfundcf.org, we have an, uh, there's that, that conversation is quite live. And I think it's a really important one that needs to grow more that you, you can have as many power dynamics at a local level as you can from an international donor or ingo or whatever and that that whole idea of power wherever it is held needs to be deconstructed and that's why the i think the emergence of things like participatory grant making participatory budgeting maybe in the government space um you know uh, uh, this idea of emergence of new ways of doing and deciding are you know are critical to this conversation around how do how do we how do we sort of manage these dynamics so that you're mobilizing new resources, but in ways that are progressive and for and inclusive and forward looking. Um, but yes, um, it's, it's uh, it sh shift the power is where it's happening. And if you haven't looked on open democracy for the letter to uh, open letter to INGOs, which has really come, it's now been signed by 150 organizations in the global South saying, oi, back off, let us build our own domestic constituencies of, 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 um, of a constituent base and don't come and fundraise here. That's, I think that's a particular touch point of that, of that conversation as well. Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll close up now. Thank you so much, Caroline <laughs> and, and Marianne for um, creating this. At various points in the last year, I was like, why did I say yes to doing this? <laughs> but I'm so glad I did and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it and I really appreciated hearing from my fellow writers and the contributions of everyone who joined this clearly very popular conversation. So a great job to, to both of you and everyone else. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. And I want to give each of us uh, speakers just a chance to close out and add anything that you might might be burning still to say. Do you want to, do you want to I don't know which order we can go. Jessica, <laughs> do you want to add anything? Oh, that muting thing, sorry. <laughs> Oh, it's okay. So, I mean, I come at a lot of my sense of decolonizing actually from having studied the history of science and the anthropology of medicine. And so um, the one very fascinating lesson that I learned from there is that basically all knowledge is subjective mm -hmm. and that actually even the notion of truth or the notion of fact it came out of a particular historical construction. And because it was old white men with, from a class background that was privileged, who, de who decided to define what the truth was, that's what we're still stuck with today. So the greatest power we have is to actually acknowledge and, um, and interrogate and, and bring into life the other truths that exist in the world. Um, and so this kind of initiative is crucial. We need to engage each other's knowledges. We need to um, make, make, make normative the idea that the intuitive, um, the collective, the, the fact that it's diverse, the fact that there are so many knowledges, we need to make that a normative assumption. And we can do it if we actually work together to decide that we're going to change some of the kind of basic terms of debate in the sector. So I really appreciated being able to engage and for all of you engaging and to just say that we actually should, if we want to shift the power, we have to do it by tackling some of these underlying assumptions, again, about who is able to define and state what is true and what isn't. Um, and I think if we acknowledge that, we have a tremendous amount of agency to start shifting some of these uh, discourses and ideas. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you for being here. Ella, do you want to uh, have a final word? Oh, unmute. There we go. <laughs> uh, just to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I think uh, building on what Jess Jessica is saying, in terms of tackling underlying assumptions, also tackling underlying assumptions about the practices that we follow and what we believe about the organizations that we're a part of and bringing in our experiences and bringing in our full bodies, our full humanity into the spaces that we are working in. So when we talk about shifting the power, that's at all levels of the system, whether that's rethinking how we do funding, rethinking how we do organizing with communities or rethinking how we do our everyday practices and human resource policies and decision-making things inside our organizations. We're working at so many levels of the system and it's wonderful to have conversations like this because you realize 
there's so many people who are recognizing this and wanting to do this work in different ways. And so if there are other people who want to think about this internal work of organizations and how we do this differently, I'm totally open and happy to continue the conversation. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Ella. Thanks so much for being here. Alex, do you want to have a final word? Uh, yes, very briefly on the funding, I just want to make a plug for Edgar Villanueva's book, Decolonizing Wealth, because it talks about this dynamic of um, historical sources of wealth, but also this ability of saying no and, and who gets funding. And then second of all, I don't think I made this clear enough in my talk. Um, and so let me be crystal clear. I'm very much complicit in a lot of what I described in the article. And so a lot of it is coming from that place. Um, and so uh, if you want to join me in continuing to make mistakes, but at least reflecting on them, please, please do. This is really, really difficult stuff. Equity doesn't happen overnight. But um, so I look forward to also being challenged in a lot of what I said, because even I'm not convinced about it. So thank you for this opportunity. Thanks, Alex. Just as we close, that uh, just re reminded me about um, Edgar's book, Decolonizing Wealth, just to say that um, there's interviews with him, a longer interview with Jessica, interviews with Ella and all kinds of other people that you can get through Healing Solidarity, which you can find on healingsolidarity.org. I don't want to spend a long time plugging it, but um, there's loads more stuff to cut, uh, listen to and watch. Um, via healingsolidarity.org so if you haven't come there and found out about it do and there's an online space you can join called the collective the healing solidarity collective and a lot of those conversations are available in there and there's also downloads you can get on the website but i think it's midday thanks so much everyone that go check out the journal come find at, um, the other resources on healing solidarity thank you so much for being here and uh, have a good day and stay well